All right, so uh, we're going to get into module 12 today, and uh, this is going to be a, a fairly quick week. Um, we're going to cover module 12 today. We'll cover module 13 on Wednesday. Both of them have assignments associated with them, but um, with spring break coming up the, the week after, I wanted to get both of these together because they're both kind of related to the same topic. Um, I don't expect everybody is going to go home and work all spring break on these assignments, but you might have a little bit extra time to, to get those caught up. And then the, the assignments following this are what I would classify as sort of like stuff that's good to know, but I'm not going to make you do an assignment on it because the topics are a little bit more advanced and a little bit more just theoretical. And that's not really what this class is about. This class is really about programming and software development, that sort of thing. So we're going to um, give us some lighter coverage. This week, though, we're going to jump into what's called object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming, or OOP, as it's sometimes called in the programming world, because we're lazy and we don't like to, you know, pronounce whole words. That's a lot of effort. Um, object-oriented programming is sort of the uh, highest form of programming, if you will. Like, when you think about, like, what does a professional programmer do and how do they operate? What kinds of tools they use? What kinds of structures do they use? Object-oriented programming is definitely it. Uh, you, if you go into programming, will be using primarily object-oriented programming uh, in a career. If you use professionally developed modules or frameworks, whether it's in Python or any other language virtually, they will probably use an object-oriented model if the language permits that. Not all languages are able to do object-oriented programming, but most are from JavaScript to PHP to Python, and of course, all the variants of C, anything you can think of. Um, uh, anything you're gonna do for iOS is gonna be out of the box object-oriented. So if you're coding apps of any kind, you'll be using object-oriented languages. All of the iOS frameworks use object-oriented frameworks. So you really need to understand how it works. And I'm gonna warn you, we're gonna start out with some theoretical concepts and sort of understanding what object-oriented programming is. But for me personally, and for a lot of people, understanding object-oriented programming in a theoretical sense without the practical side is really tough. It's sort of just this squishy like, okay, I see that that's something you can do with programming but why would you want to do that? What's the use? Why, what's the point of it? Um, and really in terms of how we've done this class, right? We started out with some really basic structures and things. And all of a sudden we saw our code get really long and really involved just to do some basic things like play rock, paper, scissors, or manage a bank account. Um, and then as we started adding these layers of complexity, right? We added custom functions, we added modules, um, what we saw is that code started shrinking down again because we removed redundancy, we made it more efficient, we made it more usable, that sort of thing. Well, I would say sort of the final layer of complexity that we want to add is classes and object-oriented programming. And that one structure just gives you a little bit more of an edge. Everything you do, well, virtually everything you do with classes and objects in Python could be done another way that might be longer or slower or more involved, uh, but definitely less cool, right? So if you wanna be a programmer like in a serious way, you really need to sort of start thinking in terms of objects. So we're gonna ease our way into it a little bit. So a class, a class is the basic foundational piece of what object-oriented programming is built on. When you think of the word class in Python or in any object orientation, what you should be thinking about is a blueprint. A class is a blueprint for something that could be created. And it, it defines everything about that thing. It could be anything, really. It could represent almost anything. But uh, the blueprint contains instructions for what are called methods. Outside of a class, methods are just called functions. So a method inside of a class is a blueprint 
for a function that lives inside that object. Now that object also contains what are called properties. Outside of a class, properties are just called variables. So methods are functions that live only inside a class. Properties are variables that live only inside a class. Yes. So when a variable is inside of a class, it's a property, and when a function is inside of a class, it's a function. Exactly. Well said. Maybe you should just come up and teach. Uh, so when we use a class, when we create something from that blueprint, right? If I have a blueprint for a house, it's just still a blueprint. The blueprint isn't the house. The blueprint just describes what the house is going to look like, the, where the windows are, the roof, all that stuff. When I create the house from the blueprint, now I've created something. I could create 100 houses from the same blueprint. And they might all look exactly the same. They might all different, have a few different things, like a different color or a different door or different window size or whatever. Everything that we create from the blueprint is called an instance of that class. Okay, so properties, methods, and instance are words that are important to us here. So when I create a class, very simple, this is the most simple class I could think of. If I have a class called CL car, nope, when I create a class, I start with the word class. I usually include CL in the class name so that I remember it's a class because, you know, I'm a little slow. And then I use camel case to tell me what it is. Just like when I use a function, I'm like, create something or do something. Class tells me what it is. So I'm creating a class that represents a car, and it has one property. It's an integer, and it has wheel. It's the number of wheels that it has, okay? So if I create a car, an instance of that class, I would do it like this. I would say my car, so I'm setting up a variable that represents that instance. We wouldn't really call this a variable though, we would call that an, either an instance or an object because it's more than just like an integer or a string. There's a whole object in here and it could be a lot of data associated with it. Plus it can do things. So this object, my car equals CL car, meaning I'm using this blueprint to create this object. So far so good, right? So if I wanted to print out the number of wheels that that car has, I would say print my car dot int wheels. So I'm accessing the int wheels property of that instance, which is based on this class. Tracking so far? Okay. You're probably still at the stage because this is where I'm always thinking like, why would I go through all of this trouble to, to describe how many wheels a car has? That's like a lot of extra work. There's a lot of overhead for that. And it's true, you probably, if, if your class was truly this simple, you would never use class or an object-oriented programming for that. But when your objects start to get more complicated with multiple methods and properties and things like that, then you'll, then you'll see why there's value here. So if I wanted to change the number of wheels that my car has, again, I'm using my car dot int wheels. And this is how I access, this is not a global variable, this is a property of that object. It's a property of the my car object. So I'm accessing it from outside that class by using the dot notation that says this is the car. Remember, it's not the, I'm not saying CL car dot into wheels. I'm saying my car, this one that I created using the blueprint. I want to change the number of wheels to six. Okay. So in terms of a method, let's use the same class, CL car, and let's say I still have the end wheels, but let's say I want to start create a method called start car. So in the CL car, notice it, this whole code block is indented because it all belongs to that class. So if I have a method called start car that just prints out the words vroom vroom, it looks just like it looks just like a function. It's set up the same way as a function. And once I create the instance, my car, I would call that function my car dot start car, just like I would call a function, but using the dot notation because the function belongs to the object. Okay. So if I wanted to, I could pass it a parameter. 
but even if I don't pass it a parameter, just like with a function, I have to include the empty parentheses. Now there's one method that you can define called init or, or short for initialization or initialize. Basically, this, this function has a special name. It's always two underscores, I-N-I-T, two underscores. It always has at least one parameter, self, that's required, because what it's saying is it's, it's self-referential. So when you create an instance of this class, it's going to automatically execute this function. It has to have this because it's saying this is an initialization of this class. So that's what self means. If you want, you can require other parameters. If you require other parameters, then when you instantiate that class, right, you create my car, you have to supply those parameters. So if you put something other than self here, that's required when you create that object. So what it does is it executes this and all it says is take this parameter and set it to self.intwheels, which is an int wheels property inside that class. Same thing here, str make is a string that contains the make of the car. So when you create that object, it automatically gets created with a make and a number of wheels. Okay, so we'll be using this today, which is why I wanted to explain what it was. So for this assignment, I wanna get quickly into the assignment and stop hanging out in theory land because like I said, I think the land of the theoretical doesn't really do us a lot of favors when it comes to really understanding how classes and objects work. So for this assignment, we're gonna make a playlist, okay, not, a music player, but just a playlist, basically a list of songs using object orientation. So we're the class that we're going to create looks like this, and it's got three properties. It'll have four methods, at least. You can add other methods if you want, or other properties, I don't really care, but it has to have at least the minimum. So it'll have a title, a year, and a rating. The rating is just going to be a string containing one through five asterisks because that's easy to deal with. It's going to have a method called get year, which when you execute will just return whatever's in the year. It'll have a set year, which will allow you to change the year. So you'll set, you'll set it with a parameter that's a string containing the year. Get rating and set rating. So three properties, four parameters, Every song will be created from that blueprint. So this is the blueprint for every song in the playlist. So we create that class. Then when we want to make a playlist, all a playlist is is a list of songs, right? Thriller, 1985 stars. Surfing USA, 1963, three stars, and so on. That's what a playlist looks like, right? So when we want to take a playlist and create it in... Python, we're just going to do it like this, right? It's just an array. It's not even a dictionary. It's not nested dictionaries. It's just a single array. And because remember, an array can contain objects instead of strings or integers or other types of data. It can actually contain a whole object here. So this array, AR playlist, is my playlist. And it's just a list of instances created from that class, that blueprint that I'm using. So this one, Thriller, 1985 stars, Surf USA, 963, three stars. If I want to add, how did that get moved around? If I want to add something to the playlist, then I'm going to append another instance of the object. And I'll show you what this looks like in code in just a few minutes. If I want to access the set rating method of that object, I'm going to say, let's say I wanted to change the rating for Thriller from five stars to three stars. I would say AR playlist, zero index, which refers to the first item in the, in the list, 
dot set rating, three stars. So that's how easy it is for me to, to zoom in and do something. And remember, set rating is a method that lives in each of these objects because they get, those, they get that from the blueprint. So each one can do that thing. And it knows that you're setting the rating of that song because you're referring to that method. Everything happens inside that class to that one object. So let's take a look now at some code. This code that you're looking at right here is already on Canvas. And it's a strong, strong start for this assignment. Normally, I don't give you this much code to start with, but I want to focus on getting you to the place where you understand the, the object orientation, how it works, and how it's put together. So I, I got you a lot of the way there, and you can actually use this code for your assignment and just add to it. So I've created first a list, an empty list called LIS Playlist, and class CL Song. So each song is going to be based on this class. The initialization method sets the title, year, and rating. So when you create a new instance of that class, you have to supply it with those three strings or it's going to error out. Once it uses those strings to set the internal class variable or the class properties for title, year, and rating, it'll print you added a song and then it'll print the title of the song that you added. Okay. There are two more methods that I created. I didn't create all the methods that you need in that class, but I created two more so you could see how they work. So I have a set year self and str year. And basically, if I pass it a string that sets the year, then it takes that string and it puts it in the self dot str year. So it changes its own year. And that's how you set it. You don't you you have to use self dot str year so it knows that it's changing its own year not some global variable okay so that's how and this one is get yourself you don't have to supply it with anything but it just returns the year so anytime i say get year to an object that's created from this it'll return the year that that song was written okay and then i have outside of the class a global function that is just a main menu which you've seen me do that kind of thing before but i want to point out one more thing again i i talk a lot about sort of how i put together a program remembering that we import objects or we import modules first then we define global variables i would say the next thing you want to do is classes then global functions then the meat of the program last. So if you just sort of keep that order in mind, it helps you stay organized. Um, so once I've defined everything, line 25 here is kind of where the program starts. And the first thing I do is I'm actually putting a, an instance of the CL song into that list. So I'm actually loading a song into that list using append so I use the list variable dot append. And then inside the parentheses, I'm using, I'm calling the class. And then I'm giving it the information it needs. So that adds a song to that list. If I wanted to add another song to that list, it would be easy to do. I would just type the same thing, but give it a different, uh, a different song. Let's see. Well, I'm seeding it with a few songs, but you'll see in just a second uh, that as I write this, you'll see, let's see, I'm going to run it. Oops, wrong one. There we go. So when I run this, you can see it's it's doing the initialization of each of those objects. So now in, in my list, I have two classes or two objects, Thriller and Still DRE. And then I'm, I want you to fill out the rest of this program. Now I did all, I did number one already for you. 
right? If I press number one, it's going to spit out the songs and the years they were played. And that's super easy. This is where we started to get into some of the, the powerful things you can do with objects in a list like this. So I'm just using a for loop to iterate through each of the playlist and I assign it to the variable song. So each song, each time this goes through, becomes the next object in that list. And then it says object.stringtitle hyphen object.str year. So it's real easy to just zoom in, access those, those properties and spit them out. So what you'll need to do is the rest of this program. So add a song, delete a song, and update a rating. So you'll need to figure out what needs to be done here to fill that in. And you're also going to need to complete the class with the get rating and set rating um, methods. And then whatever you want, whatever other customizations you want to do to this code. So you can start with this code. Some of this, a lot of the structures there for you. You can change things if you want, but you don't have to. Um, mostly, I just want you to get get practice with working with objects in a list like that. Because on Wednesday, we're going to move up to the next sort of level and talk about something called inheritance. Okay, so inheritance is. Not when your rich uncle dies and leaves you a lot of money. Unfortunately, it has to do with object-oriented programming. So, But, you know, if you master inheritance in object-oriented programming, maybe one day you can be the rich uncle. I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. Or ant. So, anyway, uh, good luck. And let me know if you have any questions. But I, I'd say the best way to learn this stuff is by playing around with it and sort of getting your feet wet. Object-oriented programming did not become real to me. I kid you not until I started actually trying to do something useful with it. So I hopefully that helps you.